Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's Cybersecurity Roundtable, How to Build and Scale a Cyber Program. Thank you to everyone for joining us. We will randomly select five participants from a drawing for a $20 Starbucks gift card as a token of our appreciation. Coffee's on us. This discussion will be recorded and shared with you all after the event. If you have any questions for the panel, please feel free to submit them in the chat throughout the discussion. Let's meet our panelists today. First, I'll start with Angel Kern, who is a Cybersecurity Program Director at Technical College of the Low Country, located in South Carolina. Angel, can you quickly introduce yourself and your background? Sure. Um, Angel Kern, I'm a Certified Information Systems Security Professional. Primarily started out in banking, running IT divisions for years, and then switched into teaching high school and teaching college the last 15 years. Um, but yeah, I've been working on specifically cybersecurity for the last 20 years, helping Penn State, Tech College, Harrisburg University set up cybersecurity programs. Thanks, Angel. Next is Dr. Machika McLean, who is the Dean at the University of Cumberlands, located in Kentucky. Dr. McLean, please tell us about your background. Hi, um, I'm Dr. McLean. My background started um, actually as a consultant in IT for a local business here in West Palm Beach, Florida. And then I had the opportunity to start as an adjunct. So I uh, went from IT consultant to an adjunct. And now I've been in this field for 15, 15 years or so. Um, and with the areas of database administration, cybersecurity. So yes, 15 years in the game. Thanks, Machika. And our You're final, welcome. Our final panelist is Dr. Felix Davis, who's the Computer and Information Technology Department Chair at College of DuPage, located in Illinois. Dr. Davis, tell us about yourself. Yes, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for allowing me to participate in this panel. My name is Dr. Felix Davis. Uh, my background is I got started in the field of IT through the military. I served as a wireless encryption engineer for the United States Army, setting up networks uh, pretty much all over the world in support of the military. Um, after my military career, I transitioned into corporate America, working for various companies such as IBM, AT&T, Advantage, and a few others, Tail Labs, where I function in various roles, including network engineer, design, implementation, um, troubleshooting, and things of that sort. And I just decided to make a change in my career towards the back end, and I transition from being a network engineer to being a college professor teaching in the field of IT and cybersecurity. Um, I've now been doing this full time for 10 years. And similar to Dr. McLean, I was an adjunct prior to becoming a full time professor where I did that uh, eight years in adjunct. So collectively, uh, 18 years in the educational field and about 25 years in the profession. Thanks, Felix, and, and thanks for your service. Uh, today's panel will be moderated by Ray Chu, who's the Director of Product Management for Cybersecurity at Jones and Bartlett Learning. I'll pass it off to Ray to introduce himself and, and get started. Thanks, Mark. Hi, everyone. My name is uh, Raymond Chu. I'm the uh, Director of Products at um, JBL. And um, just a little bit about myself as well. Um, previous to JBL, I used to be an administrator at Bellevue College here in Seattle. And I taught as well as an adjunct uh, for a little bit at North Seattle College. And my experience is in um, tech, specifically working for companies like Microsoft, Citrix, and Computer Associates. Uh, let's kick it off. Um, so thank you for joining us today. Um, to give everybody a little bit of a context in terms of where the industry is, especially with regards to cybersecurity. So you, if you look at the left-hand side here, we, we see a tremendous gap in terms of the workforce for cybersecurity. Uh, in terms of demand and supply, and this is data, a bit dated from IS, ISSC Square, and this is data for data on 22 uh, for last year. They estimated that there are about 4.7 million people in the worldwide cybersecurity workforce. So that's a big size when you look at it. Uh, and that grew about 11% year to year uh, for 21 to 22. Um, of that number, there's about 1.3 million workers in North America. And 
right now, they estimated that there's about 3.4 million uh, gap in terms of cybersecurity workers that's required in around the world. You probably heard at the beginning of the month that the Biden administration announced their new cybersecurity strategy. And with that comes a lot of things that they are looking at specifically uh, in terms of private and public partnership on how to address cybersecurity concerns, but also plan for the future. So that will translate, I suspect, a lot of new opportunities in terms of the roles that has to be filled to address some of those concerns that um, that's been thought about at the federal level, but subsequently rolling down to the local level as well. And then on the right hand side here, when we think about cybersecurity education and training, the opportunity is tremendous. I think this is worthwhile to look at, even though it's mostly on the B2B side, um, where we are getting some of the data. Uh, essentially, when we look at the training market, the US market is about $10 billion for 20, 20, 2019 and projected to grow to 18 billion or roughly um, by 27, 2027, right, as projected. So that's about an 8% growth in terms of um, the uh, size of the trading market space. And when we look at the B2B space specifically in terms of the trading market, that's a large market, obviously, because now we have employees in the mix as well as um, private and public sector. And the growth there is even uh, uh, significant as well. Um, so right now, when we talk about um, the, the uh, growth of the market in terms of e-learning only, specifically e-learning, online learning, that grew about 14% uh, from 2020 to about uh, $710 million by 2025. So there's opportunity in terms of cybersecurity training on the e-learning side of things. The total addressable market is about $11 billion roughly for business and employees training. And then from there, um, when we look at the serviceable market for it, that's close to about a billion dollars. So in terms of the larger piece of pie, the piece that's being, gonna be addressable by what we're doing will be close to about a billion dollars roughly. Um, and that's just uh, the estimating, right? The, the scale of cybersecurity and what the market holds for us. So with that, Let's kick off some of the questions we have our panels here addressed today. I'll start off with um, the general question about starting a program, because I think in the audience, there might may, may be some folks out there thinking, I want to start something, right, with cybersecurity, and how do I go about doing things like that? So I think the key thing to ask the panel is, for anyone involved in the early stages of building a program, what advice would you give others as they think about growing and scaling such programs in their own institution. And then also talk a little bit about what cybersecurity guidelines or frameworks you're using to help build those programs. There are a few of them out there. The, the most obvious one is NICE, based on the NIST cybersecurity framework, which is undergoing an update for version 2.0. So I'll start off with our panelists starting from alphabetical listing. Um, and I'll start off with Angel. Angel, can you tell us a little bit about what you're doing on that end? Sure. About two years ago, um, I happened to see a news article about South Carolina and how Governor McMaster was, was committed to building a cyber training ecosystem in South Carolina and, and in an effort to raise their standard of living. So I was intrigued and I inquired about it and um, ended up going to work for Tech College of the Low Country, leaving Penn State and coming down to Tech College. And I've been working with a group called the South Coast Cyber Consortium um, and to set up a cyber training ecosystem down there. So uh, it's a group of, it's University of South Carolina, it's the Tech College system in South Carolina, the governor's office, county and state economic development people, government people. And basically we secured a $1.3 million Department of Defense grant to stand up programs. Um, so I, I would tell people don't reinvent the wheel. Um, there are states, Colorado, um, uh, Virginia, there's other states out there that are standing up cyber training ecosystems. So I, I tell people to go after 
the Department of Defense grants. We're actually writing for a $30 million National Science Foundation grant right now to further build our, our cybersecurity training ecosystem. But that's at a 50,000 foot view. Um, you know, I'm actually involved in the day-to-day -day activities of actually standing up a new associate's degree in cybersecurity. So what we did was we proposed a new CYB, C-Y-B, cyber security degree. And we proposed a series of courses to the South Carolina Tech College system um, and that basically mirrored the National uh, Security Administration's curriculum for their cyber, their Center of Academic Excellence in Cyber Defense program. So we directly mapped our courses and our program to this NSA training program so that we can get accredited to offer an NSA certificate to our graduates. So they leave being a, basically with a certificate and letter from the National Security Administration that they have received training in cyber defense. Um, so all we've mapped that out. One of the things that I, I tell people that are trying to set up these cyber training degrees and programs and certificate is don't reinvent the wheel. There is a lot of good material out there. Um, one of the things I struggled with was finding textbooks and virtual laboratories because everything we do in cyber is very needs to be very hands-on. And, they're, and maintaining your own virtual laboratories and come up, coming up with ethical hacking activities is, is very time consuming. So um, one of the things that I did too was went out to all the book vendors and started saying, what do you got? I need cyber, I need virtual labs, I need virtual laboratories. And thankfully, JB Learning was one of the first vendors that really started offering really quality uh, virtual laboratories and cloud labs and stuff. So we've de designed a program down in South Carolina that you know hits all the all the all the federal and Department of Defense and National Science Foundation learning objectives, um, but also industry standards. We've built them into our new degree: uh, CompTIA, Network Plus, Security Plus, Linux Plus, Pen Test. Um, but definitely, um, we're, I'm trying to share this with as many people as I can across the South Carolina system. I'm happy to share my syllabi, my course material, um, you know, JB Learning's textbooks and virtual labs. But we've literally built an entire uh, two-year applied associate's degree in cyber defense using JB Learning textbooks and virtual labs. Thank you, Angel. Next, I'll move to Felix. If I know some of the um, programs that you have are already well established, but I think for somebody who's thinking about studying something new, is there any advice that you can share with them? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, again, thank you for the opportunity. Uh, our program has been around for some years, but it was not originally a cybersecurity program. It was more of an IT program, and making that transition uh, is different. Um, understanding and uh, sharing with those that are involved, especially with your administration, uh, with faculty, that the technology that's involved in cybersecurity is different than your standard traditional IT skill sets. And because that, therefore, you need to understand that that's going to require different resources. Uh, as Angel mentioned, uh, the lab environment, it needs to be different. It's not as simple as going and purchase the computers and things of that sort. So I think that's a critical part is understanding the technology that's involved in cybersecurity. Um, the program that I uh, am I'm the department chair of, we have achieved and been recognized as a national center of academic excellence in cybersecurity by the NSA. Um, so as Angel mentioned, that's a critical part so that we don't have to recreate the wheel. So we're following the NIST guidelines and the NICE guidelines uh, in regards to that. And that framework helps ensure that we're creating appropriate and valid up-to-date curriculum in that regard. Um, another factor that I would say is aligning yourselves with organizations such as JBL, where um, you're able to get some of that heavy lifting done for you. Um, it is a challenge to keep that curriculum up-to-date, especially in an area where it's constantly changing, and it's just a matter of time before it changes. And to own that and be responsible for labs, curriculum, 
that can be a heavy lift depending on the size of your program and the, uh, the number of faculty that you may have. So strategic partnerships with vendors such as JBL is essential uh, in my opinion. And I think that sets a stage where you can uh, make quick transitions and quickly grow. Thank you, Felix. Next, Majika, can you tell us a little bit about your um, advice as well to somebody who's thinking about starting something new? Again, I think you have an established program. So yes. Yes, so um, our program was established back in 2017. And so what we did, like Dr. Davis, we follow the guidelines of NIST and um, and because we are designated as a um, center of academic excellence as well. So we followed the NIST guidelines. And at that time, you know, like um, Angel said, JBL was the only organization around that offered that pathway to help us develop these courses. And so between JB Learning's pathway and following the guidelines of NIST, we were able to use that to help us develop the cybersecurity program. And so having those guidelines, it helps you to understand what, what resources you would need and providing those hands-on labs for our students is very essential because we have to make sure that they have that experience to go into the workforce. And if they don't, you know, your your program is not where it should be. And so making sure those hands-on labs are in there, that um, real world scenarios that these students are able to kind of critical think through is very important. So that NIST guideline and, you know, the JB Learning Pathways was what we used um, to make sure our program, you know, is successful. Thank you, Machika. You're next, welcome. I'll move to the next question, which is on uh, existing programs. So for existing cybersecurity programs, what are the efforts that you're taking to help to grow the, the programs? And also, what do you see as some of the biggest challenges while growing and maintaining that program at your institution? Uh, again, I'll start off with Angel. Well, getting, getting a new degree established, the cyber degree, was a huge hurdle. That took almost a year to get it approved through our Department of Education and Tech College system in South Carolina. Um, and then getting all the accreditations, aligning with partners. It took about a year to get everything up and going. Um, but now we're rolling. This is actually the first semester we're teaching this new degree. Um, and believe it or not, getting students is easy. That's the easy part. Once you preach the salary potentials of cyber, the students just sign up. And where do I sign up? The hardest part has been finding cyber qualified staff, people with cyber backgrounds and educational backgrounds that can teach these courses. Um, so growing our program is going to be a matter of finding staff and getting staff trained. Um, the other part is is funding. Um, you know, our grant that we spent the 1.3 million now, and now we're going after NSF funding, National Science Foundation. They are offering 30 and 40 million dollar grants to stand up ecosystems in states. So our next hurdle is going to be get get more grant money so that we can continue to do, to to hire staff and get qualified staff in. But the other big hurdle is getting um, government, especially public education, to realize that we've got to pay our educators more. That's a huge hurdle for us to being able to continue to hire staffing. And we can get the students, It's we just can't get the staff to train the students. Um, so I'd say grant money, students, funding, um, and the accreditation process and keeping your accreditation now is going to be key. The, the NSA Cyber or Center of Academic Excellence isn't so easy to renew anymore. You've got to prove that your institution has a cyber maturity uh, position. So now you've got to provide your information security programs, policies, incident response plans. Um, so I think a lot of new schools that get into getting these certifications and getting these programs up and running don't really realize yet that there's a lot to keeping your accreditations and keeping these programs going. 
Great. Thanks, Angel. Felix, what advice do you have for people who have existing programs, but are trying to grow it and do better with what they have? Yeah, our program has been around for a while now. I think, uh, as I mentioned, we've been an IT, an IT program probably for over 20 years. But transitioning to the cybersecurity, we've been doing that for about five to six years already. Um, some of the things that have been impactful in helping us grow our program is marketing. And when I say marketing, it's at a program level. Uh, understanding and helping others understand what is cybersecurity and what does that mean? Um, because it's a really broad term to use the word cybersecurity. So helping uh, marketing has been key. We've been strategic in expanding our dual credit program where we partner with the local high schools uh, and working with the high school uh, teachers to be able to offer the appropriate programs at the high school level. But that brings on a different aspect that you're going to be challenged in having the right people and uh, the right skill set to support those efforts. We've also expanded um, our transfer agreement. So our entire program, every single course in our program is for credit. We are not a continuing ed program. Therefore, the approval process for each course the programs, the degrees, and the certificates are approved at the state level. Um, and, and as Angel mentioned, that process can um, take time depending on the approval process. So one of the things I would encourage everyone to think about is when you're creating your curriculum, be careful about how you design and create it, making it very narrow and specific to a vendor or to a certification or to a program can run the risk of if that program or that certification goes away, you now have a curriculum that's outdated. So making the curriculum align appropriately to industry certifications is a great marketing tool, but making it broad enough that it can be adaptive and change over time is critical for us. Because once that, uh, we got caught with Microsoft, for example, Microsoft recently discontinued their uh, server certifications. So if you got curriculum directly aligned to that, now you've got to go back through that approval process to update and change that curriculum. Um, some of the challenges I foresee with this process of growing is for us is space. Um, as Angel mentioned, we get, a, we get a lot of students. Students are aware that cybersecurity is the buzzword. The, the labor of statistics have identified this area as a huge growth opportunity. So having physical space and uh, appropriate faculty to teach the curriculum is a challenge. So if you can get ahead of that curve, uh, you need to be thinking about that. Um, and this one's a little odd, it might sound a little bit weird, but getting the right students. Um, they see the salary range and, hey, I wanna be in cybersecurity. Yeah, but this is an area that people have to understand. This technology is going to change and it's gonna change very rapidly. One of my ongoing jokes with some of my faculty colleagues is, I never get to laminate my notes. <laughs> you teach math or science, you can go ahead and laminate your notes. I can't, it's going to change. And students need to understand that they're entering a career path where it's forever learning. And if that's not something you're you know, really interested, you're not passionate about it, the money is good, but it is a serious lift to stay up to date with the technology and the changes uh, that are occurring in the field. Thank you, Felix. But Chica, what can you provide advice to people who have existing programs and are looking to make their programs better? I would say from, from some of the things we have experienced, um, Felix and Angel has mentioned as well, um, it is very important to stay up to date because this field changes very quickly. And staying up to date can also be a challenge because if you have a massive program and like my degree program in the School of uh, Information Systems, Information Sciences, we have roughly almost 6,000 students. And so, and over 200 something faculty. So <laughs> try to keep up with the change and making sure those changes are implemented across the board is a challenge. And making sure you have enough resources in place to help faculty, because if we are able to help our faculty, they are in return able to help our students. And so 
marketing plays a good part in that as well. If you have a great marketing team, they can get the information out there and then students start to talk. Because students have, they may be in the cyber program, but they may have friends that are in like counseling or business and, you know, they start to talk about what's going on in your program. And you can actually, not saying we're trying to pull other program students, but I'm just saying, you know, it is a possibility that you can start recruiting other students from other degree programs because the things that you offer in your program is cyber. So, you know, being, you have to be able to market the audience that you're dealing with and, you know, being able to capture their attention. But one thing Felix um, made a comment about is the, the type of students. You know, you, you may get a student that's in the program, but they realize it's not for them. And so you're not, you don't want to, you know, discourage them from it, but what if you offer like a minor in it, you know, so they can get a couple of the courses under their belt and they may still pursue another degree program. So being able to still um, capture the attention of the students without losing them, may be offering a minor in that area. Thank you for that, Machika. And I think the fact that um, Felix, Angel, and you brought up the issue about student success, I think let's jump into that one. I think that's a, a pertinent issue um, for a lot of the people out there as well, because you know, with, obviously with, with the end of pandemic uh, coming up from it, um, you're going to have students who want to jump in because there's opportunity here. They see that you know high paying jobs but also the fact that, as I mentioned, the Biden administration with the new national cybersecurity strategy, meaning there'll be new initiatives and money, right, flowing into those kind of programs. There's a lot of things happening. And I think one of the things about student success is, how do we make them successful so that we can be successful um, as a provider, as well as the institution? What are the steps and support mechanisms um, that you think can be helpful to assist and prepare students to implement uh, so that you can help them enter the job market, but also successful with the program? And um, what have you found to be most successful among some of those things that you're doing at the college? Uh, again, I'll start off with Angel. Sure. Um, internships I've identified as being very important to uh, the cybersecurity type student. They really need to spend some time working on like a SOC, a security operations center team, working with seams and sores. Um, so we've, we've purposefully built two internship opportunities into our new associate's degree. Um, and and we, are, we are struggling with how we are going to set up a security operations center and and monitor the college's endpoints and then hire students to work on this security team. Um, so in the meantime, I've gone out into the community and talked to our state, gov our local government, our county government, our police departments, and I've secured internship positions for them. So, um, you know, a lot of these employers, if you look at the job descriptions out on uh, on the various job boards, they want experience. They, they advertise it as an entry level job, but yet they want experience. Um, so we are we're trying to make sure that our students graduate with experience. Um, so um, but s staging that experience, like my students are engaged in something called National Cyber League which is a collegiate ethical hacking competition every spring and fall semester. It runs with the semesters. So my students are actually competing in capture the flag competitions, ethical hacking competitions. But I think more important than their developing their ethical hacking skills and you know the red team, blue team skills is having them actually work on a network or security operations team as an intern. Um, but that's something that we should be maybe, you know, working with Jones and Bartlett Learning to establish virtual SOCs, security operations teams, where my students can go practice working in that remote-like environment. Um, but there's definitely a lot we could be doing in the industry to stage these work or learning experiences, real-world experiences. And, and, and I know there's tons of small businesses out there 
that need help monitoring their own security postures. So the South Coast Cyber Consortium is actually talking about getting the funding to stand up a regional security operations center, kind of like they have up in Charleston, South Carolina, the Naval Information Warfare Command has a 750 person security operations center up there that monitors the security posture of the entire East Coast Naval hospitals and offices and, and things. So um, definitely internships and hands-on type work experiences are key to our students' success. Thank you, Angel. And, and interesting, um, when I was at Bellevue College here in Washington State, one of the things I was trying to set up too is an apprenticeship program for cybersecurity. Um, and I, it's something that I think some states are really eager to help set up. So I think that's that's great that you mentioned that as well. Felix, yeah. um, what what are the things you're doing on your end as well to help student success in your organization? Yeah, uh, if I'll piggyback up what Angel described, uh, we are very intentional ensuring that our program has extensive hands-on. I don't think you can create an effective cybersecurity program without an extensive amount of hands-on. So we strategically align um, our program to ensure that the vast majority of courses provide that hands-on capability. That's that's top of the list in my opinion. Uh, in addition to helping students prepare for a career outside of that, uh, and using this term student success uh, in academia, I, I find that to be a debatable topic. Um, in some environments, uh, some administrators might look at student success as how many students are graduating. And that's a flawed theology because Many students are not necessarily taking the curriculum because they're looking to graduate and earn a specific degree per se. A large number of our students are simply looking for a skill set that help them gain employment. So what we've done with our program is about 90% of our program is strategically aligned with industry certifications. So that as that students complete that curriculum, they now have the ability to go out and earn what we call stackable credentials. They can go out and earn an A plus certification, Network Plus, Security Plus, uh, Cisco, CCNA, et cetera, and beyond. And that helps two things. One, it markets your program because now you're not just depending on the name brand recognition of your institution, but you're following the lead of industry leaders such as a Cisco or a virt a VMware for virtualization or Red Hat, things of that sort. So I think those things are critical to one, educating the students on the value of an industry certification while also providing them with strategic hands-on so that they can leave your classroom. And I tell them all the time, don't update your LinkedIn profile to say you took a class in this. Your LinkedIn profile needs to say you have experience configuring or provisioning or setting up and get in the habit of identifying what nomenclature, what product have you worked on, so that that reflects your hands-on experience that you have. Um, the cyber competitions, I think, are a great um, exposure. But what I what we are constantly hearing from the workforce in this region is that a lot of the younger generation are showing up, and they have a technical competency, but they lack soft skills. So helping them understand that the importance of being able to write, communicate, do presentations are also a critical skill set that is not just your technical competency that is essential to your success uh, in, the, in the field of employment. So those type of things. And there's a big initiative in this region, and I think it's a national movement in regards to apprenticeship as opposed to just inter inter internships, where they're looking for businesses to strategically partner while students are going through and formalizing their education earning those stackable credentials and moving towards the degree. So I think a combination of those things are uh, what I would recommend in that regards. Great, thank you, Felix. And Machika, what advice do you have uh, for our audience in terms of how to help students to be successful? Um, what we do on, on this side, we do things, uh, of course, we have the students to participate in cyber competitions, um, you know, the National Cyber League, even the NSA Code Breaker Challenge, stuff like that. But 
what we do, we have developed and put together what we call an advisory board committee. So the advisory board committee are individuals that work in uh, corporate, whether they are, you know, uh, they are CEOs of businesses or, you know, work in the, a specialist, IT specialist, digital forensic specialist. So we have a board and with them, they provide us with information that they hear is needed in the field. And we take that information and find a way to implement it into our courses. And one of the things that have come across very often is soft skills like Felix said, soft skills. And so we have a unique audience because some of our students are international students. And so they come with the tech background, but yet they lacking those soft skills. And so being able to implement, you know, projects, um, engagement projects into the courses to help them with those soft skills so that they're better prepared. So when they go into the workforce, they have that tech part down, but would they be able to survive without the soft skills? And so being able to bridge the gap between the technical skills and the soft skills so that they are successful. So a combination of that with the, you know, capture the flag competitions and um, making sure they are engaged is a good way so that the students can be, you know, successful. We use group projects because if you get into the field, it's a good chance you're going to have to work in groups with people. So you have to be able to deal with different personalities, different perspectives, you know, stuff like that. And, you know, you may not see eye to eye. So how do you deal with you know, deal with that. You know, do we agree to disagree? But we still need to get this project done, right? Because we have this timeline. So putting them in groups to help them understand how it works when you're dealing with multiple people. So um, that's what we do on our end. We've been pretty successful with it. And but it still goes back to making sure. And what another thing we do, a lot of my professors are actually um, they advise our students. And so a lot of them work in the field as well. So they're able to tell these students um, things that they can do to help them in the field and you know so a lot of students go to those professors like hey i want to i want to get you know i want to become this you know i want to be a digital forensic analyst what can i do you know you know help me to so when i graduate i'm able to land this job and so they kind of mentor them a little bit you know um to help them build the things that they build the skills that they need to build to be able to be successful you know in the workforce great Thank you. Those are all great advice and feedback, I think, uh, for people who are thinking about cybersecurity programs. So before we get to the last question for the panels, um, I just want to let the audience know that you can submit questions in the chat so we can get to them after this last question that we have for the panel. And then we'll try to get to some of those questions in the chat shortly after that. Um, so panel, uh, the last question is, on what advice would you offer to an administrator, a dean, or somebody who's thinking about cybersecurity if they don't have it in place, um, and what they're thinking more in terms of uh, the things that they need to reach out to so that they can build those programs that you, wonderful programs that you have right now? What would that advice be like? So Angel, can, uh, we'll start off with you again. Sure, thanks. Um... You know, thinking outside the box is critical. Well, if we're going to solve this cyber skills shortage in, in the world, we really need to think outside the box. We really need to think about start st starting to work with people that we haven't really worked with before. Like, um, you know, I'm working very closely with Jones and Bartlett Learning. Um, they're carrying the curriculum, the virtual cloud loads. We're working with our the South Carolina Tech College system. We've got to kind of give up our territories and agree we're all on the same territory and share and gain economy of scale. Um, you know, we've got, I'm willing to give out my curriculum, my Blackboard learning management system courses. I'm willing to share to solve the, I mean, it's a top 10 national security threat, a lack of cyber trained people. So we have got to think outside the box and cross boundaries share resources and really push to make up this cyber skills shortage. 
Thank you, Angel. Felix, uh, what advice do you have for administrators thinking about cybersecurity programs? <laughs> this is an interesting question for me, being in the role of a chair, and I also teach the curriculum as well. Uh, number one at the top of the list, uh, in, in my opinion, for administrators is qualified adjuncts do not grow trees. You cannot simply settle and uh, bring in faculty because they're available. It requires a specific niche of skill sets to teach cybersecurity. That's number one, which leads into the staffing concerns that have been discussed here already. Um, equal with that is the change of pace in the technology. It's going to change. It's just a matter of when and how and how impactful that change will be to your program and your curriculum. And in some instances, we have to accept that individuals that may have been have that may have been very good at doing something historically they may not be as effective as things go forward and change because of the techno technological skill sets required to deliver that curriculum um, the enrollment is a big factor in in every evaluation of any program that's that's business within education itself but we have to be careful about looking at enrollment as the only metric or the primary metric, that there has to be a balance with quality of a program, that you can increase your program and have all the students, but if you're not effectively teaching it, if they're not getting the hands-on, if it's not uh, aligned to the industry standards that are that the skill sets that are needed to be effective, it'll only be a matter of time before the reputation of that program suffers. Uh, I think uh, Dr. McLean mentioned it earlier, the students talk. So when they go through and they have an experience within your program or within a class, that's your biggest marketing tool, in my opinion. We can say and you know show nice pictures and do all those different things, but ultimately it's that student's experience within that class and what they define as success post-class that determines how effective that program can be. And lastly, I'll say um, for us here in uh, Illinois, the pandemic taught us a very valuable lesson in the fact that if the pressure's there, we can do what we need to do. We transitioned approximately 60 to 75 classes from a fate, 95% of our program was face-to-face -face before the pandemic. And in March of 2020, on a on a dime, we transitioned to online and delivered every single course without canceling a class. And I'm talking 75 sections, averaging maybe 20 to 25 students per section. And that was not an easy task. And, and obviously, you know, hindsight being 2020, we've learned some lessons. There are room for improvement, but it taught us that we can do this. So, you know, we have to look at what our needs going forward and the ability to effectively deliver this type of content in an online format. And I'm not talking self-paced, that's a different subject. But when we're talking synchronous, live utilizing tools such as we're utilizing right here, that we have to begin to expand and look outside of the norm to effectively do this and be a good program going forward. That's my advice to administrators. Thank you, Felix. I'm sure the cybersecurity folks are really resilient folks, are a team of people, right? Um, with that, Machika, what would your be, advice be for program administrators who are thinking about cybersecurity in general? My advice would be, uh, first of all, don't try this on your own, okay? <laughs> That's number one. Number two would be build a team. OK, build a team of expert matter, subject expert matter, subject matter experts. OK, and people who see your vision. OK, because they have to see it and they have to understand what you're trying to do. So build a team that understands your vision and make sure that you're all on the same page. Um, if you have a team in place, then they can all strategize together on how to do that program and how to build it. Um, 
I do believe the motto, if we build it, they will come. OK, so if you build it, they will come um, with the amount of cybersecurity jobs that are out there. Um, the demand is there. So it's just about building a program that would catch these students attention, that will a program that would ensure them that when they get into that marketplace, they will be OK. Um, and that goes down to the content that you are providing. And it goes back to that hands-on experience, real world scenarios. Um, that all is very important, but having a solid team in place and you're strategically planning the program will be the best place to start. And having, you know, companies like JB Learning and using the niece, you know, saying this niece, um, guidelines and platform to help you you know you have to have a goal and once you have that goal you are able to write that plan and execute your plan so having a team in place you know is very important so that would be my advice having that team in place and strategically planning um having that goal there I, it would be that's very important because if you don't have a plan and you you're gonna it's going to seem like you're overwhelmed and you keep hitting this wall. So you have to have a plan and reach out to other institutions that have done what you're trying to do. You know, have that support system as well. Um, that is another thing that can help because you can ask them questions and they can give you their um, perspective on on it and how you can achieve those goals. So having a team in place and having, you know, that partnership with other institutions that are already doing what you're trying to do is is, is a way to success. Thank you, Mishika. And I hope we'll be able to do more of this in the near future as well so that uh, it benefits not just the audience out there, but also everybody in the cybersecurity and IT industry so that as a group collectively, right, we can help the nation with our cybersecurity defense, but also all the way down to the local level. Mark, uh, are there any questions in the chat that the panel will be able to answer? Yeah, we have a few questions here. And before I get to them, I just want to thank everyone for joining again. I know that we, we promised some Starbucks gift cards, and I just want to dish those out before people start dropping off. Um, congrats to Beth Ferry from University of Rhode Island, Dr. Joe Wilson from Liberty University, uh, Richard Bryson from Alfred State, uh, Siva Reddy, Al Lutheran, and Bridget Willis from Central Georgia Tech. Um, I'll be in touch with all of you after the webinar in terms of getting those gift cards to you. Um, Let's dive into a couple questions quickly. We had a few around staffing issues. Uh, I know it came up a couple times. Um, one from Daryl includes, do we think the staffing issue at its root is also an economic issue? Are staffing salaries competitive enough to attract more qualified trainers and teachers? Um, and Emery asks, how do you hire full-time cybersecurity faculty, not adjuncts, with academic salaries being much lower than industry ones? Um, Angel, I'll start with you because I know that you mentioned this um, earlier. Yeah, it, it's been a real challenge. You know, I, I'm I took a 50% pay cut to get get into education, so it was definitely not uh, money, but reward. The lifestyle too. I think in academia we can we can promote the lifestyle. Like, I feel like I'm getting a full-time salary, but I'm only working part-time sometimes, you know, depending on your university, how what course load you need to take. But you know, we need to get more creative in how we're going to compete. Like I said, you know, one school's offering, a, they want a PhD for 43000 a year in cyber. Well, I'm placing 18-year-old high school students with their Security Plus at 80000 a year. How do we resolve that? You literally need to double the salaries of faculty to attract them to come into uh, into, into academia. Um, but we could promote the lifestyle too. It's a it's a you know the number one job according to USA Today is a college professor. It's the least stressful job out there. It's the most rewarding job out there. Um, so we could promote that in lieu of salary, but that that is the real problem is how are we going to pay these experts to come in and teach? We need their expertise. We need their their experience. Um, you know, we don't have enough people to work on our security operations team. So we're creating seams and sores. 
um, like Splunk and Security Onion, where we've literally replicated the minds of high-end security engineers in these systems. Um, so we're gonna have to do that in education. We're gonna have to figure out, you know, uh, that's why I'm working so hard with Jones and Bartlett Learning to replicate everything I know into these learning systems because there isn't enough of me to go around, you know, with all my cyber experience and, and background. But So we're going to have to take my brain and create an artificial intelligence from it, a training system from it, you know. Um, I think artificial intelligence might be the solution, too, if we can take more of the high-end security people and put it into these systems, we can train our, our, our students then through these systems. Hopefully that answered your question. Chica, Felix, you want to add a conversation? Um, I would, I would have to agree with Angel. Um, it's about marketing how you marketed the position. Um, for me, it's flexibility. Okay, I have flexibility. Yes, I, I'm in a leadership position, but I have flexibility. Um, and it's also it could be, you know being offering more adjunct positions so you know they can get a feel for it while still keeping their you know corporate american jobs you know so they have this corporate job where they're making you know hundred thousand dollars a year or whatever and then they can have that experience as an adjunct and so they get used to it and you know they may decide to say oh okay what if i can switch it and do part time, but it's so many things going on right now with you know tech companies like you know Microsoft and all these you know Twitter doing these job cuts. So it's like you know you have to be somewhere flexible there. And I do agree, we you know salary is a problem, you know, but it's like the lifestyle. I like the lifestyle and the flexibility that I have, um, which is was which was marketing marketable to me. Um, so I don't know if we would ever be able to say, hey, yeah, we're going to offer you this 100K position as a professor, you know, especially for smaller institutions that may not have, you know, the money to do so. You know, you may not, you know, we're not MIT or, you know, down here, you know, FAU, we're not these big institutions. So we, we are not in a position to offer those, high, you know, high end salaries, but, you know, we can make it comfortable enough for you. Um, so those are, I don't know if we'll really be able to um, fully, you know, address those issues. I know it's it's a tricky thing, right? Because that's why we have a skills gap, and that's true for instructors as well. Um, but again, I think collectively we have an opportunity to uh, um, better the situation in the future. Mark, I know we're, we're tight on time, so maybe we can jump to the next question. Yeah, I'll ask one um, final question here. Carol uh, is starting a bachelor's degree program with 15 to 20 student cohort a year. Um, she's asking how much physical space is needed for that type of program. We we build a new cyber lab down at Tech College of the Low Country. One of the problems we run into is our students don't have the right computers to be able to do cyber. It it involves a lot of memory, a lot of hard drive space. So we built uh, we spent about 80 grand building a lab state-of-the-art with like i9 machines with 64 gigs of ram five terabyte hard drives so we can do virtualization and things like that um, but so many people want to build labs and i'm saying instead of putting that money into labs i would equip every new cyber student with a 1200 dollars laptop that they, they can build their tool set on um, so it's not so much about space you can if you if your students have laptops and you can meet anywhere where there's a good internet connection right but what i'm finding is my students don't have laptops that are capable of handling everything that we're doing like loading virtual box and you know a vm can be a full gig a virtual machine could be a full gig 
Um, so they eat up their hard drive space. They're running out of memory. They can't even like, they're having a hard time doing the work because they don't have the equipment to do it on. And you can't use labs because they want to take their stuff home and work on it. Um, so, you know, we are substituting some of that with the JB, the Jones and Bartlett Learning Virtual Laboratories. That way they can access it regardless of what kind of computer they have and we can simulate the hands-on virtualization labs um, and it doesn't require a real powerful laptop. But um, we did build, we got a grant and built a new physical uh, cybersecurity laboratory with state-of-the-art equipment. Um, we can zoom from that lab so we can take both in-person and remote learners in the same class. So we're offering hybrid courses now. You can attend in person or you can attend remotely via Zoom. And we integrate those courses together into one lab. So we, it did cost us about 80 grand to build that lab and equip it to be able to do that. Yeah, I would echo. Yeah, I would echo the same thing that the the space will depend on your enrollment um, in that regards. Uh, the big piece of the puzzle is we are we we are heavy on hands on. So certain parts of the curriculum, I'm of the mindset you got to have some equipment available locally for them to put their hands on because they've never seen it and they've never done that before, and that can be a challenge. So we've actually created some small portable relay racks that are on casters that can literally roll from one classroom to another so that we don't have a designated classroom for one class. That has been a huge asset. Now we're blessed enough that we have six dedicated classrooms just to our program. No one else in the institution can have access to those rooms unless we grant them access to it. But even with that being said, the growth of our program, especially uh, with enrollment being down nationwide during the pandemic, our enrollment went up. And our problem has become, I cannot find, and we're back to staffing now, I can't find enough staff. And even if I did have all the staffing, the highest demand of uh, class time frame is in our evening classes that run approximately 6, 6.30 in the evening. And I just, I have more than six classes that I need to run. So I literally have to strategically pick which classes we'll run because we don't have enough classrooms available to us. So it's a matter of, if you're in the early stages, that might not be a point, but you need to be thinking, you need to be forward thinking about how that program grows and what tools are you gonna la leverage? So are you gonna purchase Cisco routers and switches or are you gonna do it all remotely and leverage a relationship with like JBL where you can access that um, with a, any kind of computer that has a reasonable amount of bandwidth and capability, so. Thank you, Felix. Machika, we have two minutes left. Any thoughts on this um, question? I would have to agree. It, all, it really depends on, for me, the space that is available at your institution. Um, for that number of students in a cohort a year, I mean, if you had two dedicated classrooms, that would get you started, but eventually you will probably need at you know three. One that can be dedicated to just a lab that students can go and work um, around the clock, you know, when the campus is open, and then two labs where you know we'll rotate your classes. So that would be you know, but that all depends on what you have available, space available at your institution. Thank you. There's a lot of very good information today. I hope that our um, audience has gained a lot of uh, knowledge from this. With that, um, Angel Kern, Felix Davis, and Machika McLean, thank you very much for your participation today. Thank you. My thank pleasure. you. Thank you. Take care. Bye bye. Bye bye. Take care.